Do you ever tell them that you have EDS too? There's connective tissue disorders, but we don't know what they are and we don't know the genetic basis behind them. Hey guys, how's it going? Sorry that it's been four months since I posted last. Things have been really crazy in grad school and I just have not had time to do much YouTube, um, but I'm here now and today I wanted to talk with you about what it's been like to see patients who actually have HEDS, CEDS, and other types of connective tissue disorders. I just completed my cardiovascular genetics rotation and so many of the patients that we see in that clinic have a connective tissue disorder and the most common one is probably HEDS that we see. If you're not very familiar with my channel, just for a quick background, I'm a second year genetic counseling student at Mount Sinai in New York City and on this channel I talk a lot about EDS. Um, HEDS specifically, it's comorbidities, but also some other connective tissue disorders. And so I asked you guys on Instagram if you had any questions about what it's been like for me to see patients who have my disease, as well as other similar conditions and other connective tissue disorders. So let's get into it. But I first just want to say thank you so much to Vitassium for sponsoring this video. They recently just came out with a new drink, like electrolyte drink line. Let me show it to you and I have yet to try it and I'm so excited to try this. Um, it's filled with salt, so we'll get into that later. So what's the reason why people get referred or come in? So I guess the first thing I kind of wanna like lay down is that in cardiovascular genetics, you're not just seeing patients with connective tissue disorders. There's a lot of different types of cardiovascular disorders that have a big genetic link. And while connective tissue disorders make up a big part of that, some of the other conditions that we frequently see would fall into different categories having to do with like the electrical system of the heart. So these are things like long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome. We also see patients who have cerebrovascular disorders. We also see patients who have cardiomyopathies. And I would say that cardiomyopathies and connective tissue disorders are like really the two big categories that we see. Um, we also see patients with AJTTR. Um, which is a type of amyloidosis and and then i guess like hypercholesterolemia i saw a couple of those but those are really like the main categories of what we see and i would probably say that like connective tissue disorders makes up like 35 percent of the patients that i see okay do you see aneurysms in eds good question it depends on the type of eds so um with some of the rarer forms, um, absolutely. So vascular EDS, you know, aneurysms are definitely something that we're very concerned about and it's important to get screening to make sure that there aren't any dilations or aneurysms because the risk with an aneurysm is that it could potentially dissect or rupture. And if that is, if it ends up being a major artery like the aorta, then that's actually life-threatening um, and it needs to be addressed like right away. So it's, it's so important to be able to identify who is at risk for having this um, and you know genetically diagnosing patients who do in fact have one of these higher risk um, artery disorders. We would really say like aortopathies because anything that involves the aorta becoming very dilated is concerning. In terms of HEDS, um, you know, there's a lot of mixed literature on this. And I don't wanna to speak too much to my experiences because I only have a couple of, I only had like two months worth of clinic, um, but I did see probably like literally like 60 patients or something, it was really quite a lot. There was a good study done by the people I was working with. So Dr. Amy Kontorovich and Veronica Fettig, as well as some other people that work at Mount Sinai in the cardiovascular department and genetics departments. Um, and they found, let me see. So for, they looked at people who have HEDS and people who have HSD. Um, if you don't know what HSD is, there's kind of a lot of speculation that it, that it very well may be the same thing as HEDS, um, but for what we know, it causes basically the same symptoms. People just don't pass the, the clinical criteria for HEDS, and so they're kind of placed in that HSD group. Um, so they found that 7.5% 7 of people with either HEDS or HSD had a mitral valve prolapse, um, and then 15.2% had a thoracic aortic dilation. And they found a couple other things. Um, so they found SCAD, which is spontaneous coronary artery dissection in a couple patients, but the statistics are still pretty low. Um, they also found cervical artery dissection in two patients. 
Oh, actually, scab is in three patients, sorry. Yeah, that's basically all that's important. The good thing about HEDS is that most patients who end up having an aortic dilation it's usually a dilation, not an aneurysm. Sometimes it is an aneurysm, and even when it is an aneurysm, it's not that likely to progress. Whereas in some of these higher risk disorders like Marfan syndrome and vascular EDS, we see more progression of that aorta size over time. Um, whereas in HEDS, it usually stays around the same size. And that's really, really great because that means that we don't expect most patients with HEDS who have a dilation to experience a dissection, but it's still something that should be monitored. There's also some studies that have found way lower of statistics, but a lot of the times I think those studies are looking specifically at aneurysms and not dilations. So a dilation is between uh, 95% and below 150% of the size that you would expect in somebody of that age and height. Um, and then an aneurysm would be above that 150%. So I think some studies were probably just looking at aneurysms in the past, and so it wouldn't have, you know, gathered as many patients, but also things are different between, <laughs> between institutions. And usually what we do with HEDS patients is we'll give them one, um, one echocardiogram, thoracic echo, and if you don't see one, then they're in the clear and we don't need to keep doing echocardiograms, but, but we do recommend doing one just to get a baseline and also make sure that there isn't that dilation or aneurysm that needs to be watched. Thank you so much to Vitassium for sponsoring this video. I've actually been waiting for weeks to try their new line. It's a powder, it's like a salt powder as opposed to salt pills for people with POTS, dysautonomia, and other conditions that require them to increase their salt intake. Um, I have POTS, so I need to have literally as much salt as I possibly can to increase my blood volume. And one of the major things that you need to do when you take salt is drink water. So this is, let's see, it's called the electrolyte drink mix. They have two different flavors. There's a pink lemonade and a fruit punch. And I'm gonna taste them both right now. They told me they were gonna send these to me and I've been waiting for them to come and I'm so excited. Okay, this one's the fruit punch. And in each of these, there's 500 milligrams. Most people, like somebody without POTS, usually the doctor will say like, don't have more than two grams of salt or 2.3 grams of salt um, in a day. So these are 0.5 grams of salt. Somebody with POTS, depending on what your doctor wants you to do, could have up to like literally 10 grams of salt. I try to get six if I can. Um, and one of the major ways that I do that is by taking Vitassium's salt pills. It increases your blood volume. And that's why salt is so important, but drinking water with salt is just as important. Okay, this one's the pink lemonade. I feel like I'm more excited for this one, but who knows, we'll see. Also, please don't judge the fact that I'm doing this in a wine glass. Oh, it's really good. It's really good, I like it. It tastes like some sort of candy that I used to really like. Also, surprisingly, it doesn't taste very salty. I can definitely tell that there is salt in here, but if you said that there's like 0.5 grams of sodium, I wouldn't have expected that it tastes like this. This is the fruit punch one. Mm. It's really good too. Mmm, they're really good. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna give them a literal five out of five. That's really good. Um, if you're interested in uh, checking out Vitassium's new electrolyte powders, um, then I will leave a link down below. And I think I can also link it in this corner. Thank you so much for sponsoring this and for sending all these to me because I'm definitely going to be um, drinking them a lot. Also, I forgot to say they sent, um, like they also have bigger tubs of it. So it's not just in the individual packets, but these are really convenient for for travel purposes. Um, anything I was not surprised to see. I guess like an interesting thing to bring up, and I, I, I was not surprised to see this. I was hoping I wouldn't see this, but I was not surprised to see this. Misunderstanding of the difference between the types of EDS and people coming in thinking that, um, like with one type of EDS, thinking that they may have another type because it's kind of confusing why these literally like distinct disorders are all classified under the same condition. Like, I don't really think it's the best idea. I don't think that these are all the same disease and we know that they're not all the same disease. And it's really nice to have community and be able to make these connections. 
And I think that it may be better though, if those connections were made on the fact that these are all connective tissue disorders, but not that all these types of EDS are really the same disorder at all because they're no more similar. Some of the, like a lot of these conditions are no more similar than EDS is to Marfan or EDS is to Lloyd's Deeds. Like there, there's no more similarity between them. Some of them there are, but some of them there aren't. And so that's kind of like, it, it's confusing and it's confusing for medical providers and it's confusing for patients. And so a lot of doctors will refer somebody in for something that it just doesn't make sense. Like that patient probably does not have this type of EDS or like, for example, like I can't give too much information, but we had a patient that I literally diagnosed with vascular EDS and like somebody thought that they had HEDS, like in an odd situation, but like you can't, like they, they, they're just not the same disorder. And like, it causes so much confusion and potentially bad treatment um, for people. It's like, you know, another thing though, is like coming from another side where people with HEDS get worried that they may have a type that is higher risk in terms of like being life threatening because they have something like POTS. So for example, like, um, many, many people with AGDS have POTS and it's by far the most common type where somebody would have POTS. But when you hear POTS, you think, oh, tachycardia vascular. And then people get worried that they have vascular EDS because they have vascular features, but that's completely distinct from the types of vascular features you see in VEDS. So they, people with VEDS can have like orthostatic intolerance and things like that. But when we say vascular involvement in VEDS, we're talking about aneurysms, dissections, and ruptures of, of all these different arteries. So like, that's not the same thing. And when you look things up about VEDS, it can be really scary. And so people can come in being scared that they have a type of EDS without, without actually having any of those symptoms because of just like a misunderstanding. And it's a completely reasonable misunderstanding. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's totally reasonable to be, to, to have this misunderstanding. And that's why I think that it just doesn't make any sense to classify these disorders under the same umbrella. They should be under the same umbrella of connective tissue disorders. We can all be sisters in that way, but they are very different. Okay, were you surprised by anything? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of really interesting things that I saw. I think this is something that I've, you know, definitely understood for a long time, but this rotation really ingrained in me how a lot of what we know about connective tissue disorders relate to conditions that have a really high risk um, of aortic aneurysm and dissection. Um, and that's because that's life-threatening when it's really big. So over the last you know, 30 years, as we've understood genetics, a lot of people that have been studied are these patients that have connective tissue disorders that specifically affect the aorta. There's a lot of different connective tissue disorders that don't really affect the aorta that much or maybe at all. And research has not been that focused on those patients. I think largely because it it's not like, they're less likely to be life-threatening, but even more so because it can be hard to identify which patients have this when it's not such a very specific thing like an aortic aneurysm, for example. You can't just take a screen and say, oh, you have EDS, you know, HEDS, it doesn't work that way. But here's where things get interesting. And I, I didn't really realize to what extent this is something that they see in clinic, where patients come in with either like a, a vertebral artery dissection, carotid dissection, and they do have some connective tissue features but they have ne negative genetic testing, they do not have an aortic aneurysm, and they do not pass the criteria for HEDS, and we don't really have that much suspicion that it is HEDS. Like they don't have chronic pain necessarily, they don't have all those other things that come with HEDS, but they may have other connective tissue features. And so it really just ingrains in me this idea that there's connective tissue disorders, they can totally affect the quality of life and even be sometimes really risky but we don't know what they are and we don't know the genetic basis behind them because they're the main, you know, area of like focus for the disease is not the aorta, if that makes sense. So research has not really been focused on those patients. And that's just one example of like the type of connective tissue, you know, patient we could see. Um, and they don't have HEDS. They don't have any positive genetic testing for any of these other conditions that we know about like Marfan or Lois Dietz. One example of this would be mass phenotype, M-A-S-S. -S. Mass, like M-A-S-S, -S, it stands for um, 
mitral valve prolapse, aortic aneurysm, um, like skeletal features that we see in Marfan syndrome, like a Marfanoid habitus, where like their limbs are really long and they're very tall and lanky. They may have scoliosis. And the last one is, the last one is skin. <laughs> so some skin features like um, skin fragility, stretchiness, things like that. And these patients have negative genetic testing for Marfan syndrome, all the other connective tissue disorders. And they definitely don't have HEDS, but they, they have some sort of connective tissue disorder and we just don't know what the, what the gene is. And it's not that genetic testing hasn't been done on these patients, but not enough genetic testing has been done. Um, and like not enough studies have been done on this. And so this is a you know rising area of research, which I hope to contribute to. Do you ever tell them that you have EDS too? No, I've never done that. Um, and I don't really, I can't really see a situation where I would do that. I think if it would somehow aid the appointment, I could think about doing it. But if I just want to say it to say it, I'm not going to say it, you know? Um, I obviously, like if a patient were to recognize me from a YouTube video, I think that'd be a different scenario, but I don't want to, I'm not going to say it. And I also think that that, like, this is actually something I wanted to mention. And I was worried going into this that I was going to be like, overly identifying with the patients because like it's really important to be listening to your patients completely and understanding what they're going through to some extent and having empathy um but having empathy is different than from identifying with the patient and that's not really that's not our job we're not supposed to identify with the patient and that can actually really hurt rapport and be you know not it that's not what the appointment is for and so i was worried that i was going to be feeling that way and that seeing a bunch of hds patients would make me like feel kind of like sad or depressed or like I, I just too much eds but i think because i wasn't really feeling too much like identifying with the patients and i was able to make that separation it actually wasn't like that at all i didn't feel that even once I just felt really excited to like hear about hear, like hear more about it and also to actually offer people support because I know what it's like to go through a really long diagnostic journey, not have any answers and to have doctors dismiss you, not listen to you um, or just have a really short appointment. And this is something that I think was so like amazing about our clinic we can spend a lot of time with a patient um, and I actually call the patients beforehand. So I've spoken to multiple patients with EDS and with a bunch of other conditions for literally an hour um, beforehand. I can, I have a lot of time to talk to these patients because I can call them, I call them beforehand. I get family history. I ask them a bunch of questions about their condition, why they're coming in, why they were referred. And I can really hear their story and talk to them about it um, and really kind of provide some of that psychosocial like side of things that you just don't really get in most doctor's appointments. And that doesn't mean that these doctors are like bad or something. There's also usually just so limited time, you know? And so I didn't ever feel rushed and I always felt like I had that time. And so that's really cool that I got to call them beforehand. And then in clinic, we also can take our time. This is a specialty clinic. These appointments are not 15 minutes long, they're longer. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you have any more questions. Um, and thank you so much again to Vitassium for sponsoring this video. Bye.